Hello. This is the second part in the uh, processes and the threat discussion. This unit is quite short. We talk about the threats basics. In the remaining of the semester, after doing programming number two, we will move to uh, the use of threats. It is because the use of threads is much easier than the use of uh, processes. Furthermore, it's cheaper. Well, we'll see why very soon in this unit. So what is a threat? Again, we will divide this term in an intuitive way. A threat is just a basic unit of CPU execution and uh, threats are created by processes. A threat is also known as a lightweight process, LWP. Why look at lightweight? It is because a threat, just like a process, has a threat ID, a program counter, a register set, and a stack. And that is it. So basically in terms of the ID, program counter, register set and the stack, a threat is similar to a process. However, this is the part that makes the use of threat cheaper because threats are created by a process. A threat shares with other processes in the same, uh, a threat shared with other threat in the same process is called section, data section and other resources, including the heap, the files and the signals. Now, let me remind you, signals was uh, briefly discussed at the end of the introduction section. Lecture two, say, SIG INT is interrupt, control C. SIG kill, SIG stop, and so on. So signals are not interrupt. Interrupt are used to communicate uh, between the hardware or the program through system calls with the system. And uh, signals are used for communication between the operating system and uh, your program. Therefore, signals has a different meaning in operating system than uh, interrupts. So this means, suppose a process creates, creates several threads. All of these threads, each, each of these threads would have their, their uh, threat ID, program counter, register, and their stack. But the code section, uh, data section, and even the heap files and so on are taken from the process. So all of the created threat by this process share these items. The only thing these threat do not share would be their own threat ID, their program counter, registers, and the stacks. So because a threat requires less resource than a process does. Therefore, we call it a lightweight process, LWP. On the other hand, a process sometimes is referred to as a heavyweight process because it has a whole lot of more items than a threat has. So a threat has a single thread of control. A process has a single thread of control. If that threat, that process does not create threats. So here's a diagram showing to you the differences. Suppose you have a process and this process does not have any threat. So this process has its process control block for sure. And this process has its address space 
And this process has stacks. The stacks of a, in a uh, address space of a process usually is divided to, into two sections, the user step section. That is used when the user uh, program is run. And the system stack is used when the stress, due to whatever reason, enters the operating system. For example, through a system call. We do not have a heap and the data section and the code section here, but what I want to make very clear is that a process has a control block, address space, and a step. Now, suppose in a system, a process could create threads. Then the process still has a process control block, PCB, and its own address space. Then for each thread created, it has the thread control block or TCB, which is a very similar in structure to a process control block. And this thread will have this stack. This thread will have this stack divided into two again, the user part and the system part. So every time when you create a thread, we simply create a thread control block and the stack and so on. Therefore, we know as long as a system allows a process to create a multiple thread, what the system need to do is create a thread control block and the stack. So the register set would be saved to thread control block. And so does the uh, uh, program counter. So looking at this diagram, if the system does not support thread, it's as simple as that. If a system also supports thread, well, for each thread, it has some additional thing. All of this stuff share the same uh, user address space, including the code section and the data section. But the question is, why do we need threads? First of all, the first reason is responsiveness. Other parts of a program may still be running, even though one part is blocked. That is, suppose in a system, we have multiple threads created by the same process. If one of the thread is blocked due to whatever reason, other thread may still be running or may still have a chance to run. If you don't have a thread, then if that part is blocked, then you, ha you have no way to do anything else. Uh, when I was a uh, uh, programmer, I encountered a very interesting uh, experience with respect to this responsiveness. Not sure you know this software, PageMaker. PageMaker was designed to create uh, some beautiful commercials and documents. The first version of the page maker was run on, I don't remember exactly, probably Microsoft Windows 3.0. As you know, Windows 3.0 is not capable of doing threads. You get threads when you move on to Windows 95. So the first version of page maker was so slow. Think about it. You run a program, this program must input something. That input something is for a operator to type in the information, uh, including a typesetting or uh, beautifying uh, instructions. And then you input uh, text to be formatted. Then the operation part is 
we take that information and try to reformat the whole document based on the command uh, provided so that it looks good for the printer to print it out or even send to photocopying service to generate large print. The output component is just printing or saving this to a large file. When I use PageMaker to do something, I feel so annoying. While I, the file is being saved or while the system is processing my request, I cannot type in anything else. So I am sure there are other people complaining about the same thing. In the quickly, PageMaker released the next version. This version, simply put, just added threat support. Say we have a threat to handle input, a threat to handle uh, processing, a third threat to handle uh, output. So immediately, all three threats could run at the same time. While the processing part is uh, doing typesetting of my documents, I may still be able to print and at the same time input something. Don't be surprised. This is in the, e in the late 80s. But I have to tell you, even though the VCCalc, I don't know whether you use it, probably when VCCalc was very popular, you were not born yet. V-I-C-I-C-A-C, -I, -I, I don't remember exact name, VCCalc. So VCCalc allows me to input a value while it's updating other cells. It's just like the first version of Excel. So VCCalc, C-A-L-C, next version was a whole lot of different versions and then eventually uh, Microsoft Excel killed them all. So that means even in VisCal, there is a very, very, very limited capability to do threading because while I'm typing, uh, the system's still crunching out of some numbers. The next one is resource sharing. Threats of a process or more precisely, threat created by that process by default, share many system resources, memory, files, code, data, a heap, and so on. The only thing you know that cannot be shared is the stack. Why? Which will be clear later. Because you call a threat as a function. When that function runs, you that function would have their local variable allocated. These local variables cannot be allocated in the process stack. They have to be allocated in the threat stack. So resource sharing help us to save system resource economy. We will explain this uh, more in later slides. Creating and terminating processes, allocating memory and resources, uh, context switching processes are rather time consuming compared with doing the same thing for threats. We will see why later. And the utilization of multiprocessor architecture. Multiple, pro multiple CPUs may run multiple threats of the same process. Of course, multiple CPUs or multiple cores could also run multiple threads and could also run threads created by this process. Therefore, if we have a multiprocessor system, the use of thread will simply help us saving time. And you don't need program change because it's all handled by the operating system. Now, typically, typically threats can be divided into two groups, 
The first is user threats. The second one is a kernel threat. What is a user threat? User threat are supported at the user level. The kernel does not know the existence of user threat. That is, user threat are created by your process. And the, your process must support the created threat. The operating system of the kernel does not know whether you have this threat or not. The kernel only knows you are a process. So no matter how many threads you are going to create, the operating system only knows you rather than the threat created by you. Usually user threats is supported by libraries. A library provides you all the support of threat creation, threat termination, threat joining, even threat scheduling. The problem is, or the advantage is, because the kernel does not know whether you have threats or not. Use the threat is usually more efficient. Why? Think about it. And you spend some time and pause, think about a few reasons before you continue. Okay. Suppose you continue, you heard me, why? No kernel intervention, running user thread would be more efficient. How did you get into kernel? Either through interrupt or more specifically system calls. When you get into systems through system calls, you essentially generate a track, which is of course an interrupt. Control transfers into the operating system. The operating system does a, a mode switch, switching from user mode to user to kernel mode. The interrupt handler analyzes what kind of interrupt it is and calls the service routine to serve you. Now, meanwhile, your process is suspended. Then the, the, the the uh, interrupt service uh, services finds out, okay, this is a, a threat related support and cause a threat support system to, to do whatever it has to do. And eventually when it is done, CPU scheduler picks a process to run, which is usually not yours. So your process is still suspended and the CPU scheduler may pick some other process to run. Before running that process, CPU scheduler or the kernel switched CPU mode from the kernel mode back to the user mode. And then execute a branch going to the program counter retrieved from the PCB of that resumed process. So once you get into kernel, you really don't know when you could get, get a control back. So not only uh, you may not be able to get control back, this process that is going into kernel and going back to you will take a whole lot of time. So if your process can handle threats, that means everything is done within your address space without going into and out of the kernel. So this is the meaning that user threats are usually more efficient. Now, don't continue. Please review these several minutes. Make sure you understand why user threats are usually more efficient. Pause before you listen to me for the fourth bullet. However, there is a big problem for user threats because the kernel only recognize the containing process. Suppose you are a process and you created several threats. So kernel only knows you. As we mentioned earlier, 
if a containing process or U is blocked, all threads of that process are also blocked. Do you understand that? If you are running, if you are running, the process is running. What does that mean? You are running here. You are a process. You create several threads. So you give the control to a C, uh, to a thread. So that thread is running based on you are running. So if that thread does some input output, it's equivalent to say you, the process, are doing input output. Of course, the operating system will suspend your process. Now, if your process does not have the CPU, how could you allow the remaining thread to run? So that's the problem. Let me say, suppose you live at home, your parent give you a large, large, uh, say, bedroom. And uh, you are able to clone many clone of you in order to do something. You want to watch TV, but at the same time, you want to study, then you ask clone A to study for you. And then you want to play music, then you ask column B to do that for you. Uh, probably, uh, if you want to have a concert, you assign clone B to play for you while you're at home studying. Now, suppose your mother only knows you. You are in the room. You are in the room. And you, you tell your mother that you are studying and your mother hears a TV is running, guitar is also playing. Well, she may think, oh, you are very good. You are doing multi-threading in your room, right? So you use your computer, which requires electricity. Everything requires uh, electricity. But what if your mother thinks, oh, it's too noisy, asking to stop it. And because you want to study, you will say no. Then what if your mother cut off the power? Your mother thinks cutting off the power would only affect you, right? But cutting off power would only would affect clone A, who is watching TV, clone B is playing music. So if one is affected, every other would be affected. So this means if the a containing process is blocked, all threads of that process are also blocked. Now, <clears throat> not necessarily the containing process is blocked. It's, it's because one of the process is blocked due to whatever reason. Because the, that process contains that thread. If that thread is blocked, the operating system does not know that thread. Operating system only knows you, the guy who has the CPU is blocked. So the operating system block you. So no other thread can run. Therefore, all threads of that process are also blocked. This is a big problem. So before I continue, I hope you pause for a while, understand what this bullet means and what this bullet means before you continue. Then we talk about a second kernel threads. Kernel threads are oh, supported by the kernel, unlike the user thread. User threads are supported by the user level that is handled by you. So kernel threads are supported by the kernel. So the kernel does threat creation, threat termination, threat joining and scheduling and so on. All are done in the kernel space rather than in your user space. So kernel threads are usually slower than user threat due to system overhead. Why? Pause and think about it. 
you, I, 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 I assume you know it because we explained it. Okay. When you are back, I'm sure you probably figured it out why. Although it may not be complete. Because you run a thread which is supported by the kernel. Everything that thread must, uh, must do related to creation, termination, joining, and whatever, and including scheduling, control must go into the kernel. Which means you have to go through the, into the kernel through interrupt and so on, wait there and so on. So definitely it runs slower. However, blocking one thread does not cause other thread of the same process to block. Why? The kernel knows all thread you have. Say, suppose you have thread A, B, and C. Because the kernel knows your thread then uh, if thread A is blocked, the kernel could still run thread B and thread C. So return to your bedroom example. Now suppose your mother knows you and your clone A and clone B. Your mother knows uh, three, of, three of you are doing things in your bedroom. Although your mother won't kick the door in, he, he, uh, uh, she may only say, oh, the get out is too noise. Just cut the power off. But you studying for the final, well, can still have electricity and so on. Hopefully you understand the differences. The key issue is here, kernel thread is usually slower due to the system overhead. Every time you have to go into the operating system, the advantage of using kernel thread is blocking one thread of that process does not block other threads of the same process. I want you to remember the difference between uh, these four bullets two in the uh, user thread slice on the user thread slice two on this slice. In a multi processor environment, the kernel may run threads on different processors because the kernel knows uh, which CPU or which cores is available. Kernel knows all thread you have. So when a core is ready, the kernel simply pick your, your thread to run on that kernel, on that CPU or that CPU core. So here are some examples illustrate what we have learned. Suppose you have a system. We have a CPU scheduler. Your system may have multiple CPUs. The scheduler, of course, knows how many CPU or CPU cores the system has. So you may think this way. For each problem, uh, we, the system create, creates multiple kernel thread. The scheduler schedules these kernel threads. So when a process is created without any specification, the system associates a kernel thread to this process. So when the, C, when the CPU scheduler allows this kernel thread to run, this process can run. And if this process creates user thread at the user level, so the user thread scheduler will schedule these three threads. However, if this kernel thread cannot run due to one of the threads is doing input output, this kernel thread is blocked. So the whole thing will be blocked. Then suppose when this process is created, it asks for two kernel threads so that the thread scheduler receive is handled by these two kernel thread. And the thread scheduler or the user thread creates three user threads. Therefore, because the, the uh, 
thread scheduler knows I have two kernel threads to run. So at any moment, this thread scheduler could assign two of these three user threads to two kernel threads. So this is the last case. We could assign kernel thread to, to run this. And we also allowed uh, this process to create a thread and tells the operating system that please support this thread as a kernel supported thread. So immediately this thread created by this process is, de is detached and handled by the operating system. So I would explain this with the concept of virtual CPUs. I have three real CPUs here. Then the system creates five virtual CPUs. When this process runs, it runs on this virtual CPU. When this virtual CPU does not have a, a real CPU assigned by the scheduler, so this virtual CPU doesn't have, does not have a CPU to run. So everything here stops. Now this process has two virtual CPUs to run. The scheduler may not have any real CPU assigned to this virtual CPU, or it may assign a real CPU to this virtual CPU at some moment and at some other moments, this scheduler may assign a real CPU to this virtual CPU. Or the best case is the CPU scheduler assign both virtual CPU to two real CPU. In this case, these three user level thread would have two virtual CPU to run. So this one has we still have two virtual CPU assigned to it, but only one virtual CPU is used to run this four user thread. And this kernel support thread would be directly supported by the CPU scheduler. So when this virtual CPU does not have a real CPU, this process is suspended. And if a thread a user thread is suspended and the suspend due to whatever reason say doing input output. So the whole process would be stopped. As a result, this kernel thread would be sus uh, suspended. So the remaining two user thread could not run. But for this case, even though this thread is assigned to this virtual CPU, and even this one is suspend due to input output. The thread schedule still knows, okay, I could simply disconnect this virtual CPU to you. I could use the remaining two virtual CPU to run this two user thread. Although this thread scheduler really does not know whether this virtual CPU can actually get real CPU to run. But technically it knows, okay, I have two virtual CPU. If even the one of them have is a real CPU, one of these two remaining thread could run. So this is a global picture of user and the kernel threads. Now, when you want to use a system that support multi-threads, you probably need to know what kind of a multi-threading models that system uses. Knowing the multi-threading model a system uses is important because you have to address or you have to use that system. Um, if you want to use it fully, then you have to know what kind of a model behind that system. So different systems support threads in different ways. Here are three commonly seen thread model. The first one is many to one model. One kernel thread or process has multiple user thread. So this is 
user threat level. Remember, we assign one kernel threat to run a process. So your process could run many user threat, but the kernel does not know about it. One to one model, one user threat maps to one kernel threat. The old Unix system and the Windows system. Then finally, many to many model. What does that mean? It means uh, user threats, multiple user threats map to a number of kernel threats. We have seen that in the previous slides, but here let's uh, see specific slide to explain each of the three models. This one is easiest, many to one model. So each process is assigned a kernel thread, which can be considered as a virtual CPU. So each process could create multiple user thread under the control in the address space of that process. So the kernel does not know how many threads are there as long as one is blocked due to whatever reason, the process is blocked as a result, this is blocked. So this is referred to many to one, many to one. So each process has multiple user thread that are associated with one kernel thread. If a process is blocked, all user thread of that process are blocked. This is a user level model. Now the one-to-one -one model actually has two extremes. One extreme is the traditional Unix. The original Unix model, Unix system does not support multi-thread. So each process when it is created has a kernel thread. You may think of that way and that process run as a single thread. So in this case, process is equivalent to thread. And furthermore, each process can have only one thread. If this thread is blocked, it is equivalent to say the process is blocked. This is an extreme traditional Unix model. MS stores CPM are all of this stuff. Although CPM and the MS stores are not multi-programming system. The next one is the other extreme, one-to-one. -one. Every process has multiple user thread and each of these user thread is associated with one kernel thread. Here it is. This process has three threads, each of which is supported by a kernel thread. Therefore, we don't need a thread scheduler here because the kernel schedules everything. So every user thread is a kernel thread. Therefore, if a kernel thread is blocked, its associate user thread is blocked, but the remaining user thread of the process can still run because the associated kernel thread can still run. So we have two extremes. This extreme the one-to-one -one model is supported by Windows and, uh, and current Linux and Unix, Mac, and all of the Unix alike, except it is subset. Now, finally, the many-to-many -many model goes as follows. We still have a threat handler, uh, threat uh, scheduler, but each process could be associated with multiple kernel threats. For an example, this process has two kernel threads. This process has one kernel thread, which means this for this process, it's many to one. And this one has three kernel thread, a uh, three user thread, and each of which is mapped to a kernel thread. So this is the extreme of one to one. And this is also many to one model. So these, this one, the fourth one, and the second one is many to one. And this one is many to many, and this is one to one. So in this case, each process has multiple thread that are associated with multiple kernel thread. The number of user thread 
may not be equal to the associated kernel thread. So if a kernel thread is blocked or user thread associated with that kernel thread are blocked. So these are very simple. Many to one, one to one, we have two one to one models and many to many. So you know these models. So use this model to its, to its extreme to obtain the best advantage. Then we talk about some uh, basic concept with respect to multi-core or multi-thread programming. The discussion is very short, but interesting and useful to your future programming. Say programming three, programming assignment three to programming assignment six. So if we have only one CPU, threads are scheduled by a scheduler can only run one at a time. So that means this thread must run in an interleaved way. Now, what if we have multi-core CPU, even though I have one CPU, even though those very cheap uh, laptop may have dual cores. So multiple thread may run at the same time, one on each core controlled by the CPU scheduler. Therefore, system design becomes more complex than one may expect. Your experiment starting with the next slide. And this is why uh, concurrent programming requires a new mindset you are not very used to. If you are not able to convert your mindset quickly, you may think, oh, I, I was very good in other programming class. I always get an A. Think of it again, because you may have some hard time to figure out how to write multiple third programs. So we need to address five issues. The first one is dividing activities. The next balance. The third data splitting. The fourth data dependency. Data dependency is a headache. But the strongest headache is testing and debugging. Due to so many examples you have learned so far, due to concurrent sharing, you have non-deterministic results. Now, let's talk about dividing activities. When you get an assignment, to write a program to solve it. Now you wish to use um, multi-thread to, to do it. So the question is, you have to analyze your work in hand and make sure you are able to figure out which task or which part of your program can be assigned to a thread and how that thread will run. So that after dividing your work into multiple threads, these threads will run concurrently. So let me use a very simple example to explain this. Matrix multiplication. You probably have learned linear algebra or even in high school, how to multiply two matrices. Suppose I have a matrix. Uh, we, this matrix um, has some rows and some columns, A, and uh, we want to multiply matrix A with matrix B. Now, to make sure matrix A can be multiplied with B, the number of rows in B must be equal to the number of columns of A. So the results in C would be, the structure of C would be the same number of row as in A, the same number of columns as in B. So this is the formula for calculating an entry in matrix C. So let's make our life easier. Both matrix A and matrix B have 
in rows and in columns. Definitely, the resulting matrix C would also have in rows and in columns. So let's take a look entry, this entry. Let me say that C I J. That is, this entry is on row I of C, column J of C. So how many these C I J's are there? Simple, N square. C11, C12 to C1N. First row, second row, C21, C22 to C2N, and so on. On the nth, nth row, that is CN1, CN2 to CNN. So how do we calculate CIJ? Very simple. If you don't remember it, this is the formula. How to do that? We pick row. Suppose I want to calculate CIJ, the ith row and the jth column of C. Then we pick row I of A, row or column J of B. Because row I of A and column J of B all have N elements. So we simply multiply the first elements of row I, that's A, I1, the first elements of B, that is B, one J, no, sorry, uh, B one J. That's right, column J, and then C I two, B two J, and C I three, B three J will simply multiply the corresponding pair together, and then we add them together and put the results in C I J. So A I K is the case elements or case column on row I, so row A, I, and the K. And then the corresponding elements would be B, K, J, the case column, uh, the case row on J's column. So obviously, because we have N columns here and N rows here, so this summation re would require in multiplications. So to compute Cij, we need n multiplications. Now, if I ask you to write a program to finish this uh, matrix multiplication, you'll feel this quite easy to do. Just a three-level nest, nested for loop. That was the, that would be sufficient. But a total number of multiplication is n to the cube. That is order n to the cube. Why? Each entry requires n multiplications. And we have n square entries. So the total number of multiplication required is n to the cube. Therefore, the complexity of computing the multiplication of two n by m matrices is order n to the cube. I hope you still remember the order. Now, this is your sequential mind to do things. But with a concurrent mind, immediately you notice something very interesting. What is it? While you are computing Cij, you use row i of a column j of b. You never modify anything in A and anything in B, right? So, because we never modify anything in A and anything in B, think about this. We can compute all CIG at a time. For an example, I could compute C11 using row one, column one. C12 using uh, row one, column two, because the computation is C11, C12, Cij to Cnn. They are all independent works, right? Therefore, we simply assign a thread to each entry. That is, we create a thread for each entry. Allow them to start compute computing 
the result for that cell with this formula. So each thread, after it's created, it takes in multiplication and then get the results. And all n square thread would work at the same time. So if you use multi thread, the time complexity for each thread is order n, which is n squared times faster than the sequential version. And this is why we talk about dividing activities because of the computation of this matrix C is divided to the computation of each cell. They can be computed separately. As a result, we could assign a thread for each thread. You may want to say, wait a minute. The time requires to create a thread and a terminal thread could be significant. You are right. And two, if n is very large, say two is 10, n is 10. So c would be 100 entries. We may not have 100 CPUs or 100 CPU cores, right? So, the creation termination time, the overhead, the system overhead usually cannot be minimized. But if you wish to compute the, the product of a 10 by 10, two 10 by 10 matrices, and you, we need to compute 100 entries. Now, what if, what if you have uh, say 20 CPU cores, then you could assign 20 for the first group, 20. And then when this is done, you assign the next group to use this 20 CPU course. So in five runs, we are able to compute all, all 100 entries. It's still faster. Okay. Now, this semester, we may not have time to talk about GPU programming, but GPU programming uh, the most elementary part is much easier than here, what that we're going to talk about in, in the next few weeks. Each GPU has some memory. You copy the rows of A, the column of B into a CPU, into a GPU, ask that GPU to compute CIJ and put the results and return the results back. How many GPU you have? Well, even though for those cheaper uh, GPU car, you may have 6,400 or something. They are able to do this floating point computation rather fast. So that's why our first example, even though it's, it's simple and interesting, it has a tremendous impact to your way of thinking. How to divide the work in hand into multiple sections so that each section can be handled by a thread. Unfortunately, some problems are inherently sequential. It's so difficult to be divide into tasks so that they could run nearly concurrently. What problem is it is? So far we know many. Based on the complexity model using Turing machines. Uh, you may not have learned Turing machines, but you have you may have heard of it in discrete math or some other courses. One of them is depth first search. Depth of first search is an inherently sequential algorithm. You have to be step by step. It's difficult to make it concurrent. Uh, this is not the topic of this course. So I just mentioned this in passing. You may be able to learn in, a, an, in an algorithm course offered to you at the graduate level. The second thing we need to remember is balance. What does something mean by balance? You create so many threads. Each 
of which it is assigned some sort of a task. So it would be much better for you to think this way. The work assigned to each thread has equal contribution to the whole picture, if it is possible. Why? If you assign a insignificant thread, some, some, something, a thread is assigned some insignificant work, but you allow that thread to run very frequently, that thread would occupy a core, would be scheduled by the CPU very frequently. Other more useful thread would have less chance to run. So that is why when you divide the work of the job in hand into threads, make sure each thread would have equal contribution to the whole computation. Never ever has some very busy but lazy thread. That's it does nothing but must run very, very frequently. It would simply waste uh, CPU cycle and also activate the CPU schedule so often. Now, the next issue is data splitting. Data splitting is as important as uh, task dividing or activity dividing. Activity dividing usually may be easy because if you see the things can, can run in an independent way, you just do it. But data splitting sometimes requires you to think carefully. It means data splitting is, data may be split into different sections so that each section can be processed separately. Is it possible the previous Example matrix multiplication is a good example because the data in matrix C for computing CIJ, well, it instantly you divide the data because you simply divide into n square entries. Each entry can be computed separately. So matrix multiplication is, is a very good example. Now, quicksort is another. I am sure you know quicksort. If you don't know quicksort, you probably won't be able to register this class. So in quicksort, in traditional way, the quicksort algorithm receives an array. And uh, this array is going to be sort either recursively or non-recursively, depending on the algorithm you have learned mostly in textbook, you learn recursion to do it. So in recursion, every time the array section is given, you have a lower bound to upper bound, meaning this call to quick sort must sort the array section from this lower bound to upper bound. Then in the quick sort, you may call a partition function to find a pivot element. Whatever way you want to do, you find a pivot element. So after you find a pivot element, you do the following. First of all, think about the pivot. What is the meaning of the pivot elements? The pivot elements means after some permutation, the pivot elements would be say at M, location M. It means the pivot elements is already at its final location. And the every element to the left of the pivot elements is smaller than the pivot elements. And the every element to the right of pivot elements is larger than the pivot elements. Isn't it that the pivot elements is already sorted at the pivot elements location? 
So we don't need to handle the pivot elements again. So we know what we need to sort is from the lower bound to m minus one and uh, from m plus one to upper bound u. Therefore, you call quick sort recursively by giving it L to M minus one. After it is done, you call quick sort recursively given the bound M plus one to U, right? This is what you have learned in your data structure course. But think it again. You have to build your concurrent mind gradually, and this is a good one. Sorting the left section and sorting the right section can be done separately, right? Sorting the left section will not affect sorting the right section. By the same reason, sorting the right section would not affect the left section. Therefore, in this case, if we use multi-thread, we could create a thread to sort the left section and create a second thread to sort the right section. So sorting the left section and the sorting the right section can be performed concurrently. Isn't it faster? Yes, of course it's faster if you have CPU or CPU core to do it. And if you don't have it, you have to run this one after sorting the left. So say, suppose uh, it takes T time to do that. It also takes T time to do it. So the total number of time to do sorting these two sections would be 2T. Now, but if, what if you have two cores to do it? So those cores can run in T time finish their work. So the total time to sort the left section and the right section is T. This illustrates a good example. If we are able to split the data into multiple sections, each of which can be handled by a thread, then do it, just like quick sort. Now, I hope you will fully understand matrix multiplication and the quick sort implement in a multi-threaded way. The next one is data dependency. So it means some data may be used by different results, uh, by different threads. Suppose you have two threads, they share a global variable at the same time. So the result will be unpredictable. We have seen this uh, example over and over and over, in particular when we talk about CPU pipeline. We offer you so many examples because of the concept of concurrent sharing. So if thread share some common things at the same time, concurrent sharing occurs. You have to handle it carefully because you don't know what the possible results could be. If this happened, the results may be very unpredicted. As a result, the execution of thread has to be synchronized so that only one thread can access or update the shared robot at the same time. Remember, when we talk about uh, atomic instruction in the, in the uh, operating system hardware support, we talk about an instruction called compare and swap. We use it to update a variable. Please go back to that slide and learn that concept. So compare and swap allowed us to build synchronization so that only one thread can do updating of a shared variable at any time. But we are programmer, 
we are probably not able to use this kind of atomic instruction. So we need something. This something is usually uh, supported by the operating system or thread library, which will be discussed. And this will be your second big headache. So this is a very difficult issue in frigid programming. Writing thread program is easy as long as you are able to to find out independent tasks and uh, you are able to find splitting data into multiple sections so that it can run independently. However, once data dependency occurs, you are in big trouble if you don't learn it correctly. And this is why, as I said, Converting your mindset from sequential to concurrent is usually difficult. Some may be able to do it very fast. Some may never do it during the whole semester. But I strongly encourage you to think carefully. I am sure if you are accepted by the CS department, you should be good enough as long as you pay your effort and attention to this course and do your work. And finally, testing and debugging. Testing and debugging is your real, real uh, headache. Remember, we talk about this several times. The behavior of your thread program is dynamic due to many external factors like interleaved execution, unexpected updated common variable, so on and so forth. Uh, it's also something like the system, uh, system load, CPU scheduling, so on and so forth. So many unknown factors that could affect the correctness of your program. If your program is incorrect, a bug that appears in this test run may not occur in the next. Oh, your program crashes. You run the second time, it's good. Run it the third time, it's good. And you think your program is correct in the summit. By the time when the grader runs it, well, the bug resurfaces. And if you're lucky, some bugs may never occur throughout the lifespan of the whole of the system. Or it may appear at an unexpected time. Debugging issue, like a fine race condition that is updating a shared variable at the same time, and system deadlock do not have efficient solutions. Therefore, testing and debugging is an art and requires a careful design and the planning. And this is why I strongly suggest you uh, in an early lecture. Do not sit in, in front of the computer and start typing your program. Take a piece of paper and pencil. Think it over on paper. Go through your algorithm on paper multiple times to figure out whether you may update something unexpectedly. When you are so comfortable about it, then type your program. A very bad habit for a beginner in com concurrent computing is they thought they are good at programming in C and Java or whatever programming language. But those programming languages are basically when you learned it, sequential. Now you can do divide your activity, split your data, and also Pay attention to updating something that is shared, being shared in a concurrent way. These are all troubles I have. So don't give up, but you have to pay attention. You have to pay your effort on that in order to be successful. I cannot give you the successful. I can only tell you how to do it, that's how to fish it, rather than giving you the fish. <laughs>
Now we have some a few interesting concepts to be discussed in the in the next few uh, slides. The first concept is referred to as threat cancellation. Cancellation means terminating a threat before its completion. It's just like your process is running, you use the kill or control C to kill it. But in threat, it's referred to as threat cancellation. While a threat is running, you want to kill it. That is threat cancellation. The threat to be canceled is referred to as the target threat. There are two types of threat cancellation. The first one is asynchronous cancellation. The second one is deferred cancellation. Asynchronous cancellation means the target threat terminates immediately, just like you use a kill command to kill a process. Deferred cancellation means the target threat can periodically check if it should terminate, allowing the target threat an opportunity to terminate itself in an orderly way. Okay. This looks odd. Why we need it? Good example would be you create a threat. This threat collects some resources. For example, open a file for other threat to use and allocate some memory for other threat to use. So can you kill this threat? Or can you cancel this threat? If you use asynchronous cancellation to cancel that threat, that threat is gone. Everything owned by that threat would also be gone, including the file and the memory and so on, which is not a good idea. So under deferred cancellation, when that threat receive a cancellation, a deferred one, that threat would stop running its normal code. Instead, that threat will stop running for a certain period, depending on the design. And that threat will come back, check to see uh, there are any other threat using the resource allocated by me. If there are, then I cannot go away. And I simply rest for some time, then come back some time later and check out uh, there are other threat using my resource allocated by me and so on. So this thread would do these things repeatedly until it finds out all resource allocated by me and now free. No one is using, then I could deallocate the resources and go away. And this is the, a situation for you to use deferred cancellation. So the point a threat can terminate itself is a cancellation point. Now, with asynchronous cancellation, if the target threat owns some system-wide resources, the system may not be able to reclaim those resources because other threat may be using them. As we mentioned earlier, with deferred cancellation, the target threat determines the time to terminate itself. Reclaiming resources usually not a problem. Many systems use asynchronous cancellation for process like uh, Unix. Uh, there is a POSIX uh, threat standard called the P-threat, supposed deferred cancellation. We will, we will have a very briefly review of P-threat at the end of the semester. The next concept is threat specific data in the threat safe. Data a threat needs for its own operation probably are referred to as threat safe, uh, threat specific. That is, a, when a threat runs, it may need some data for its own operation. This data is referred to as threat specific. Poor support for threat specific data could cause problem. For example, while threats have their own stacks, they share the heap. Remember, when we create a threat, 
we create, we will add, um, reg, we will have a register set stack and a thread control block and the heap is being shared. So the question is, think about this. Threads A and B runs on two CPUs or two CPU cores, cores they call M unlock at the same time. Remember how M unlock unlock is space. We talk about uh, in lecture one, the basic concept of process in the heap. We have some area marked used, some areas marked free with the size of each free area. So M unlock simply goes through every one of this free, uh, free space and find a large enough space and cut into two, one matches the needed size and return it to color with a pointer. And the remaining part becomes a free space. If you don't remember it, I strongly encourage you go back to, to watch the first, uh, first lecture, the, the concepts of process, okay? So anyway, you just follow me, M log simply search uh, those free area to find a large enough one. Now suppose thread A, thread B, executes on two different cores, step by step, fully synchronized, and then they reach M unlock at the same time, asking for the same size, say 1K. So on CPU A, uh, on CPU one, which thread A runs, so A calls M unlock. This M unlock, running on CPU one, searching for free space. Then thread B running on CPU two calls M unlock again, at the same time when uh, thread A calls M unlock. So in on CPU two, you have the same M unlock program running, right? because the two copies of M log functions are the same. And what if they run exactly the same way that is fully synchronized? So is it possible that both M log would find the same free area that is large enough? Well, this is a very probable. So both M log would cut that large enough free area into two, one used, one free. Both M log would return the pointer to the same uh, error to thread A and to thread B. And whoops, thread A and thread B should receive different area because thread A need an error 1K to run its own job. Thread B needs another error to run its, its own job. But now, because it's fully synchronized, both M log returns the same pointer, that is a big problem. Now also think about two print F run simultaneously. I will sort of this ex example. When we talk about um, how to print it, uh, to the same terminal window, when you run multiple process from the same terminal window. So watch this out. You can easily make a mistake there. The last one is to refer to thread safe, a library that can use by multiple thread properly is referred to thread safe. Library could be so many like a STD, uh, a STD, uh, standard lib, standard in, and so on. So M a lot is in a library. So if the library is thread safe, then it means when you call M a lock, it would run properly in a multi-threads 
environment. What does that mean? Return to the previous example. Thread A calls the analog running on CPU one. Thread B calls the same analog running on CPU two. If this analog is thread safe, the previous mentioned returning two pointer pointing the same location would not happen. In other words, inside the implementation of MLOC, MLOC, it would guarantee you that thread A receive a copy that is different from the copy received by B. This is the meaning of thread safe. And uh, in a thread safe uh, library, the print F would work properly. It won't print the same thing to uh, the same as uh, STDR screen buffer. And finally, we will talk about a very interesting concept, coroutines and the fibers. Now, think about how you call functions. You call the function. Then when you enter a function, the first instruction or the first statement of that function starts execution. And you run you run and run every statement, then you execute a return or after the last statement is, is done, then you return from that function. Next time you call that function, it's always repeat from the first instruction and run you through until you hit the return statement, right? That's the way of calling functions. But in the good old days, in the 60s or something, there is a concept called coroutine. In a coroutine, it has multiple entry points and exit points. So that when you exit a coroutine, the next time you enter that coroutine, it starts from the next statement following the previous exit points. So let's take a look at an example. Suppose we have three coroutines. A, we enter A from the very beginning, then A runs for a while, A has to exit. So suppose you call coroutine B, and B runs for a while, you call coroutine C the first time it ended from the beginning. So coroutine C runs for a while. Then coroutine C think, or you think that uh, the control should be sent back to A or you call coroutine A again. So instead of going back to the beginning, because A is, this is a coroutine call, execution transfer back to A to the next instruction following the exit point here. So A runs for a while then A is called coroutine C. So the control goes back to the previous exit point of C and continue. And here C calls coroutine B, B execute the while and B calls coroutine A and A calls coroutine, uh, executes for a while and calls coroutine B and so on and, and then B continue. So the execution flow here of the A, B, C, A, C, B, A, B, C. Here, the solid error, a solid error indicate execution, a dash line error indicate coroutine, enter and exit. This is a very interesting way in writing program. And now most modern language do not support it. But when I learned Fortran 1, Fortran 1 allows you to do it. Then when I, in, uh, uh, when I get into a compiler business, learning how to write a compiler, I noticed that a compiler design in the 70, probably 70 by Cornell University, called PLC, Programming Language slash Cornell. That language is a PL1, a programming language PL1 variant 
designed for student use, a very simplified PL1. And the design of this PLC language used the concept of co-routing. And then when I was in graduate school studying uh, the formal system or formal languages, I found out co-routing is a very powerful tool for implementing finite state or uh, finite state automata. Okay, and it's also good uh, to some degree to implement a tuning machine. You probably uh, have not learned finite state automata, but when you get to there, you may map the idea to co-routing or map the co-routing idea to uh, finite state automata. But I am going to talk about very interesting things by applying the concept of co-routing to threat scheduling. This is the same diagram, but I simply change A, B, C to threat one, threat two, threat three. So recall in the co-routing, we have enter and exit activities. So enter means that coroutine start execution. That's fine. Now, when the coroutine exit, you may consider that exit that coroutine means the co that coroutine cannot exit, uh, cannot execute, or losing the CPU. Now, next time, when the when the same coroutine is called, it would enter that coroutine after the exit point. In this way, you may think that thread gets the uh, control back or the CPU back. So let's take a look at this diagram. First of all, thread one runs up to a certain point. Thread one is suspended due to whatever reason. So thread one does not have the CPU. So the CPU is given to thread two running from the very beginning. So this is out, switched out. So CPU, uh, thread two has the CPU and runs for a while. And then thread two is switched out. CPU is given to thread three. So CPU, uh, CPU schedule, uh, when thread two is switched out, the program, the program counter is actually the entry point for the next time. This program counter is saved in the PCB of thread two. So thread three runs and gets suspended. Now, if the CPU scheduler determines that, let me get the CPU back to thread one. So switch thread one in from where? From the recorded program counter, right? So the entry exit point is actually represented by the program counter. So in this case, thread one gets out, thread two switched out, and thread three gets out, switched out, and thread one switched in, runs for a while, switched out, and the CPU is given to uh, thread three and switched out CPU, uh, returns to thread two, thread two gets out, CPU returns to thread one and so on and so forth. So isn't it co-routine concept is very similar to thread scheduling. And this kind of a thread scheduling can easily be implemented in a very, very elementary way. You could write three functions in some way and switch, uh, run each function as a thread and you uh, control out and get control back sometime later. You can easily do it. I will mention this to you uh, on the next slides. So now the third concept fiber appears. What is a fiber? A fiber is a lightweight thread, just like a thread is a lightweight process. But fibers must be manually scheduled 
byte application rather than scheduled by a fiber scheduler. We have CPU scheduler that schedules a process sees and the kernel share. We have a threat scheduler built into the user level to schedule a user threat. So a fiber is created in a thread and shares resource with other fibers of that thread. This is similar to threads are created by a process and shared resource of that uh, process. Of course, because when you run a when you run a function as a fiber, when that function run, you need an area to store the local verb of that function. And that function may call other functions as well. Therefore, a fiber must have a step for sure. A subset of registers, it may not have all registers and the data or local storage provided when it is created. Fibers are scheduled with cooperative scheduling. What does that mean? It means a fiber Fibers are not scheduled by a fiber scheduler. When a fi fiber must play nice, it means when a fiber runs for a while, and when that fiber thinks that I have been using CPU for enough time long, then I execute a statement to release the CPU voluntarily. This statement is usually referred to as yield. So suppose I have a, uh, two fibers, A and B. So fiber A runs for a while and execute yield. So fiber A would yield the CPU to fiber B. So fiber B runs for a while and fiber B feels that, okay, I've been using the CPU long enough. Then execute yield, assuming that we only have two fibers. So Control goes back to uh, fiber A. So map the same idea back to the previous diagram. Every exit point can be considered as a U statement execution, right? So are there any programming language implement this U statement? Yes, C sharp. Modular two, support the concept of task. Task here is just like a fiber, or you may also consider it as a uh, uh, threat. But in modular, you have to yield the CPU by, call, by execute the yield statement. So fibers are simpler than threat and resemble coroutines. I hope you go through these three uh, slides carefully. Now, how will you be able to implement this thing? Simple. Let's assume that in every fiber or thread created as a call to a function, as long as these functions do not use uh, local variable, that is, you don't declare anything inside a function. Instead, you declare everything outside of a, of a function to become all global entities. Then you can easily write a multi-threaded scheduler with the help of yield. How do you do that? Give you a hint. In C, there is a capability called set jump, S E T J M P. To use that, you include set jump dot H. So in C, you could set the returning point. And then for another function, you, you could call your function many, many times and say you set the return point before you do a recursive call. Then you start a very, very deep recursion. Somewhere you believe that's good enough to return. In, in a typical way, this recursion goes back step by step, level by level. 
But you, if you have already set a returning point, no matter how deep your recursion is, you could call a function called long jump. In one step, you go back to the returning point. On the course information page, somewhere you will see how to write, uh, how to use make file, how to do Unix multi-process come in, uh, how, how to do Unix multi-process uh, programming and so on. You also see uh, a traditional Unix signal handling and uh, how to play with set jump and a long jump. There is a very simple example showing to you how to design a very naive multi-thread system, assuming no thread would use local variable. Please read it when you have time. It would expand your knowledge. And finally, let me sum it up. A process which was discussed uh, in the previous units, process could create threat as many threats as possible if the system can support it. These threats can be user level. If they are user level, then the process handles it. If they are kernel level, the kernel handles it. Remember, user level are faster, kernel level are slower because we need to go into the kernel over and over. But if one for user level, if one user threat or the process is blocked or user level threats are blocked. And for the kernel part, that's okay because the kernel knows or kernel threat is if there is a kernel threat is blocked due to whatever reason, other kernel threat created with that process can still run. Now, threat could also create fibers. Fibers are lightweight threads. It has very few resources allocated and they are not scheduled by a fiber scheduler. Instead, fibers play nice to each other by voluntarily yield the CPU. Usually the statement is referred to as yield. So this ends our threat discussion. This unit is short, but once we start talking about threat programming, you, you will learn more. Now, this is the last unit you will feel easy. Starting with next units, the, the first obstacle you encounter will appear. That is synchronization. I hope everyone find your uh, discrete math or even your high school book. Refresh your idea and your understanding of proof by contradiction. We are going to use the, the technique of proof by contradiction over and over throughout this semester. If you cannot or fail to master the technique of doing very simple proof by contradiction, then every exam you lost 15 or even 20 points. That's not good to you. So this is my advice here. Get your discrete mathematics book back or whatever books. Refresh your understanding of proof by contradiction. Starting with next lecture is going to be kind of difficult. You missed one lecture. Don't expect you can get the idea right before the exam. You have to understand it. You cannot just go through this and skim it. Okay. Hope I, I am not scaring you. And after all, this is just the beginning of the course. There's, there is a long way to go. Lies ahead are two obstacles. Many of you may feel difficult, but you have to stay in and pay attention to the lecture and do your work. The next lecture 
starting with the next lecture in three, probably in three lectures, we are dealing with the most difficult thing you may encounter in the first half of the semester, proving by contradiction. That is, we want to prove simple algorithm that can guarantee mutual exclusion, that is concurrently shared variable will not be updated simultaneously by two or more processes. Okay, let me stop here. Always remember my advice because throughout the years, I found those who fail to follow my advice fail this course. I don't want this to happen. Okay, so see you next time. Goodbye.